Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope Church. If you're new, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff. To those of you who are in the room, welcome this morning. To those of you watching online, thank you so much for being here. Today, we are in part four of our series, The Kingdom. And to begin, we're going to do a little thought experiment from history. Here's how it goes. There was a disciple of Jesus named Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He was hired to do this by the Jewish chief priests and the elders of the people in order that he might lead them to Jesus under the cover of night because they were too afraid to apprehend Jesus in the daylight because they weren't sure how the crowds would react to that. So under the cover of night, Judas led them to Jesus where he was praying with his disciples. There were no warrants out for Jesus' arrest. When they found him, he was not breaking any Jewish or Roman laws, yet they arrested him. As soon as they seized Jesus, Simon Peter, perhaps the most loyal disciple of Jesus, drew his sword in order to defend Jesus. Here are some questions to consider. Was Judas doing good or evil? What do you think? He was the nudge that got the snowball rolling down the hill. Was he doing good or evil? Second question. Was it right to arrest a man with no outstanding warrants without documenting any charges? What do you think? Was that right or wrong? Third question. Were those with power upholding the law or abusing power? And last question. Was Peter justified in his actions? And perhaps the most important aspect is why or why not? Was Peter justified in defending Jesus with a sword? Why or why not? The reason why these questions are important is because whether or not you're aware, the way you answer this question in particular says something about your system of values. And not just the answer you come up with, but your actual thought process of how you think through your answer to this question tells you something about your values and your assumptions about life and about the world and about ethics. What we're doing today is we're looking at your personal values. In fact, the, part, the purpose of my message is to help you in your life, where you're sitting today, run a self-diagnostic, to run a self-diagnostic of what you actually value in your heart. You see, in the human heart, you have beliefs, you have values, there's things that are important to you, and if we asked everyone in the room and everyone at home what your values are, we would largely come up with the same values, family, work, God, uh, possessions, reputation, all kinds of good things, but we would all order those differently. They come in a different order for each of us. So you have two people, they both value work and family, but they prioritize them differently. One's a higher value than the other, and that will have a great impact on how they approach life and what they assume about life. Today, I want to give you some insight into your own personal values and how you order them so that you can have a better understanding of who you are and how that lines up with God's kingdom. All series long, we've been talking about the kingdom of God and what it means because Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven all the time. In fact, when he started his ministry, he gave a one-sentence summary of everything he was here to do, and his one-sentence summary was this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent means stop. Think about it. Repent literally translated into English means change your mind. He's saying, I am challenging you to think deeply and critically about what I have to say. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. In their mind, the kingdom was the reigning activity of a king. And he is saying God's reigning activity has come near. Because once in the past, they were overlapping. In the Garden of Eden, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of this world, they overlapped. They were united. God and man lived together in holiness, but sin separated that union between heaven and earth. So Jesus is saying, I am here 
to begin the restoration of the union between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. And to do that, I am going to target sin and destroy it. And if you are going to be part of my kingdom, you must repent and have a change of mind about me and about God. Here's how the people in his audience would have heard this message. Jesus confronted evil, established a people, and he invites you to live under his reign. He confronted evil with the precision of a surgeon. Jesus confronted evil. He didn't wipe out the sinners because then he would have to wipe out us because sin lives in our hearts. Jesus targeted sin living in us and through the cross, through exchanging places with you, bore your sin, paid your penalty so that you in exchange could have his righteousness and the favor that God has for Jesus is now yours. When you trust in him, Jesus confronted evil. Then he established a people. When he was lifted up on the cross, he said he drew all to himself and he invites you. And the moment you believe, the moment you trust, Jesus died on a cross for my sins. He rose on the third day. The moment you are baptized, you are united with him. You are part of his kingdom, his people, his redeemed his saints, not because of your past, but because of what he did on your behalf. And he said, he invites you to live under his reign. This is the one we're talking about today. The invitation Jesus has for you to live under his reign according to his values and perspectives. See, a way that we might think of this today to illustrate what I'm going to be talking about is maybe when there's a new head coach or a new CEO of a company, uh, they have certain values and goals. Um, so if a, a new head coach comes in, he said, the old coach, he was about strength, but my highest value is speed and conditioning, and we're going to focus on that. Or a new CEO might come in and say, the old CEO is all about sales, sales, sales. I'm about customer service and giving them a great experience. So a new CEO comes in, a new coach comes in, a new administration comes in, and they have certain values, they have certain ways of organizing things and certain things that matter, and they rank those values in order and say, this is what's number one for us. This is what matters to us more than anything. The question for us is, Jesus has invited you to live under his kingdom. Are your actual values in your life lined up with King Jesus? That's what we want to look at this morning. Now, uh, this was the theme that the Apostle Paul really picked up on in his writings. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said this way, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So where Jesus used kingdom language, Paul used more family language. He said, live as children of light. So Jesus said, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of this world. Paul talked about darkness and light, talking about the same thing. And Paul said, you were in darkness. You were in the kingdom of the world, living according to its values. But through the Lord, you have been made children. You are the people of God. That part has already happened. Jesus already confronted evil, regardless of what you think about him. That's what he did. And the moment you believe, he makes you his people. You are part of his family, but now are you living under his reign? And that's what Paul is encouraging his audience to do. Live that way. Live under his reign. Live as the children of light. Or here's how he said it in the book of Romans. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Think about this imagery. You know how uh, early, early, early in the morning, when the just way on the horizon, the first light appears. Paul says that's where we live. We can see that the kingdom of this world is coming to its end. Jesus will return. He will bring heaven down to earth. He will make everything new. We can see the light of dawn, and it is approaching. Last week, we said this is already, but not yet. The kingdom of heaven is already, but it's not yet. We are already redeemed. We are already his people, but he has not yet returned to bring heaven down to earth. So Paul uses the illustration of that first light of dawn. We can see it. It's coming. He said, since that's true, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Since this is reality, he says, live under the values of God. Live in God's kingdom. Live under the reign of King Jesus. And here's what Paul is warning us in several of his writings. In fact, all the New Testament authors do. It's possible to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven while still having an operating system that is controlled by the values of the kingdom of this world. And let me illustrate why that's important. Imagine if you lived at the end of the Civil War in a Confederate state, and you can see how this whole thing is going to end. 
Would you amass as many Confederate dollars and as much Confederate currency as you could, or would you do everything you could to trade in your Confederate currency for something that will have value beyond the war? Which would you do? You say, that's obvious. This currency is about to become worthless. I would trade it in as fast as I can for something that will have value beyond the war, because if you stockpile Confederate currency, at best, it will get you nowhere. At worst, it will undo you. That's what Paul is warning us about. If you have been invited and are part of God's people, and by God's people, if you're new to church, here's what I mean. To be a Christian doesn't mean you think you're better than anybody else. It just means you know you're better off than you used to be because Jesus died for your sins and he rose on the third day. That's all it means to be a Christian. But Paul warns, if that's you, if you're a citizen of God's kingdom, but you still have an operating system that's controlled by the values of the kingdom of this world, here's what this means at best. At best, this status will limit your impact in God's kingdom. And at worst, it will undo you. Jesus came to confront evil, establish a people, and invite you to live under his reign. That's what we're at today. Are you living under the reign of King Jesus? And to do that, we need to look at your values. That's going to tell you if you're living under his reign. Now, I want to tell you on the front end, some of you already say, we don't need, I want you to listen to the whole time, but some of you are already starting to tune out because you already know your answer, and it is, no, I am not. Here's what I want you to know. If you already know that's your answer, Jesus is still inviting you. He is still loving you. He is still forgiving you. He is still encouraging you. He says, I'm not here today to get you. See, if, God was, if God's goal was to get you, he already would have gotten you, okay? He's not here to get you. He's here to draw you in because he loves you and wants you to live with him forever. And so while today isn't going to be the most fun message I have ever preached, it's going to be one of the most important messages I have preached. So to help you run this self-diagnostic in your own life, we're going to contrast two people who are very close to Jesus, his most famous disciple, Simon Peter, and his most infamous disciple, Judas Iscariot. Now, in the Bible, there were a total of eight men named Judas. Some, seven of them are totally bummed because there is one Judas who is now famous for all eternity as the most famous traitor in human history, Judas Iscariot. We know very little about Judas. What we do know tells us everything we need to know about his operating system, how he valued his life. Uh, John, in his gospel, in his biographical account of the life of Jesus, told us this about, Ju- about Judas. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Uh, There was a woman who anointed Jesus with perfume. It cost about a year's wages, and he thought that was the wrong thing to do. So he objected. He said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Sounds very pietistic, right? He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, just by knowing he cared nothing about the poor, that already tells us an extraordinary amount about his operating system because both the Hebrew scriptures and Jesus in his own teachings put a very high premium on caring for the poor and helping the poor. Judas cares nothing of that. Not only does he care nothing of that, he steals, and he doesn't just steal money, he steals money that was given to support the poor and to support the ministry of Jesus. So we can clearly see a little bit about his operating system. He is governed by the values of this world, which ultimately has self at the center. And that is the ultimate characteristic of the operating system of the kingdom of this world. It has me at the center, my wants, my desires, my thing, my deal. I want to be God. That was the first sin with Adam and Eve. They didn't want to worship God. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to be at the center. That's where Judas lives. By the way, as an aside, Jesus knew all this, and he still put Judas in charge of the money. How come? Because in the values of the kingdom of heaven, having a lot of money wasn't a value. It wasn't the thing. Jesus knew the world was not going to change through money. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, you're stealing from it. I know it really doesn't matter, and it doesn't impact anything at all that I'm here to do. So that's Judas. That's what we know about him. Now we're going to fast forward to what made him uh, famous or infamous in history in Matthew 26. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 
pieces of silver. Then he led them to Jesus. Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, I emphasize the word swords and clubs here, uh, not just because they literally bought, brought swords and clubs in order to apprehend Jesus, but because this is representative and symbolic of the value system of this world. If you want to be number one in this world, what do you use? Things that increase your power. For Judas, money increased his power. Swords and clubs increased his power so he could make it about him. The chief priest used swords and clubs it's because they're operating according to the value system of this world. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. So now we know everything about Judas's operating system. Actually, we even know about his status. He was always near God's people, but he was not one of God's people. He was invited to become one of God's people, but he rejected that invitation and refused to be one of God's people. So in our whole continuum, Jesus confronted evil, whether or not Judas liked it, that's what Jesus was here to do. And he established a people, but Judas rejected that. However, by contrast, Simon Peter valued Jesus highly. He was one of God's people. He did trust in Jesus and was incredibly loyal and faithful to him, which led him to what happened next. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, why would Peter do that? I mean, if he cut off an ear, he was, he was going for the head, right? He had bad aim, but he was going for the head. Why would Peter reach for his sword when Jesus was apprehended, when Jesus was arrested and bound? Why would he do that? Well, it's pretty easy to see the reason why. Peter thought that God had lost control, so he used worldly power to reestablish control. You arrest Jesus with swords and clubs? I got a sword. I can play that game. And to, to him, it looked like God had lost control of the situation. If Peter believed that God was in control of the situation, he would have been chill. He would have been cool. All right, it's good. God's in control of the situation. Jesus knows what's going on. I've seen him do all these miracles. Whatever's happening, it's clearly okay. People have tried to kill Jesus before. He just somehow walked away. So I'm confident he's in control, but Peter is afraid. He's afraid. He thought from his perspective, God has clearly lost control of the situation, so I better do something. And what does Peter do to reestablish control? He uses force. He used the sword. He used the values of the kingdom of this world in order to reestablish control. Here's the question. Was Peter justified in his actions? The authorities are acting unjustly. They're not acting ethically. They're not acting legally. There's no charges against Jesus that have any merit. There's literally not even charges at this point. So this is nothing more than assault. So is Peter right? Is he vindicated? Is he justified in standing up for his rights and standing up for his freedom and defending his Savior? Was Peter justified in his actions? Why or why not? We don't have to wonder because Jesus gave us the answer to this question. Put your sword back in its place. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Now, of course, he's speaking metaphorically because not every single person who has ever drawn a sword died by a sword. What's he speaking about? He's speaking about people who use the values of the kingdom of this world as their operating system. If you're going to live according to the values of this world, that will be your undoing, is what Jesus is saying to him. In fact, Jesus said, don't you think if that were my value, I could win that game? Look at what he says next. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once 
put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels, 70,000 angels. We've looked at a couple different kinds of angels in this series. We've got uh, the cherubim. They were the angels with the flaming sword. You know, I called them like the Jedis with the lightsabers. Last week, we saw the seraphim, the angels that are on fire. They are ablaze in the presence of God. And Jesus said, don't you realize I, I could Snap my fingers and 70,000 special up, angels will show up. Let's not forget the angel of death from the book of Exodus. I think one angel could get the job done. Jesus says, Peter, um, don't you realize that I can have the entire Roman Empire overthrown by dawn if that's what I really wanted? If I valued the sword, if that was my agenda, that would be an easy thing for me to do, Peter. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen? It must happen in this way. Why must it happen in this way? Why can't Jesus do the angel thing? Why can't he just overthrow all the evildoers? Why must it happen in this way? Now, this is so important. This point Jesus is making, we'll get back to this in a second. He made sure this very evening, he brings up this same theological point again. A few hours later, he's standing in the presence of Pilate, the Roman governor, the man who is responsible for freeing him or incarcerating him or executing him. He is standing before the man who is judge, jury, and executioner, and Jesus makes sure to bring up the same point again. Look at John 18. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, "'Are you the king of the Jews?' Because that's the only charge they had against Jesus. He says he's the king. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom, my reigning activity, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, my reigning activity does not value the things that you value, Pilate. My kingdom, my reigning activity does not value the things that a normal kingdom values. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Not only did Jesus not summon his servants to fight, he rebuked his servant for trying to fight because he said, that is not how my kingdom works. That is not how my kingdom advances. That is not how my kingdom operates. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So he says the first thing about his kingdom and its values, it values truth and speaking the truth. Now, back in the garden when Jesus was arrested, Jesus asked Peter this question, don't you think I could call 12 legions of angels from my heavenly Father and be done with this whole thing, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Here's what happens next back in the garden. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. He said, am I leading a rebellion? Because every day I was hanging out in the temple. I was in public. I was teaching. I was unarmed. Uh, there was no uh, uprising. There were no riots. You saw me every day teaching and you never arrested me. So now, do you think I'm leading a rebellion? Now that word rebellion, if we translated it into English today, we might translate it as insurrectionist or insurgent. Someone who's leading a guerrilla movement to overthrow a government and establish a new one. Jesus says, do you think that's what I'm doing? Do you think I'm trying to overthrow a kingdom here? Which is funny because that's exactly what Jesus was doing. But it was an entirely different kind of kingdom he was establishing. You see, every time there's been an insurrection, every time there's been a guerrilla movement, every time there's been a coup, what happened was a new set of people came into power but it's still all the same values that the old administration, that the old kingdom, that the old empire, that the old nation had. 
It's still money. It's still the sword. It's still power. It's still might makes right. It's still authority. It's still the same things that are valued by the new people in charge. It's just we just change the people who are in charge. That's all. But the values are all the same. Jesus comes and he says, oh, I'm leading a rebellion. I am a king of a kingdom that's not of this world, but I'm not trying to put new people in power. I'm putting a new kind of power into power. I'm putting a new kind of values into power. I am revolutionizing everything. I'm the only true revolutionary there's ever been. And this is what he had been teaching his disciples up to his point. If we flash back in time a couple of years earlier, in Luke chapter 6, he summarized the kind of power that he came to bring. He summarized the values of his kingdom. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor. Jesus would have made a terrible American, wouldn't he? He says, if you're poor, blessed, satisfied, content, happy, joyful are you who are poor. Why? For yours is kingdom of God. See, there's something about the poor that realize that I am not winning when it comes to the values of the kingdom of this world. I mean, historically speaking, the poor have always been more receptive to the gospel, the good news of Jesus, than the wealthy have. In fact, Jesus said, if you're wealthy, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because we have so much that this world values. Now, another time, Jesus said it slightly differently. He said, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. And the problem many of us have is that we're kind of middle class in spirit. You know, I kind of worked for what I have, and we carry that into our relationship with God, and God's, Jesus says, it's not how it works. It's when you realize when you come to God that you have nothing in your pockets to offer him that you're finally ready to receive his gift of grace. So Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. When he talks about hunger, he's saying, the kingdom of this world and its values, you realize they're not going to fulfill you, but there is a satisfaction waiting for you. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your names as evil because of the Son of Man. When people treat you that way just because you love me and follow me, Jesus said, you will be blessed. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. There's another kingdom, Jesus said, and that's the one I care about. And I'm going to bring that kingdom down to earth and make everything new on the last day. So rejoice, for that is how they, their fathers treated the prophets. The prophets who came from God and said his truth were often rejected by the people. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. What he's saying is if you are looking to the values of this world, like wealth, to be your meaning in life, careful. If you look for your comfort here, you've already received it. There's the kingdom of heaven still coming. Which one are you valuing? Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now. The word literally means kind of scoff or mock or taunt. Like, yeah, I won. I'm the best. I have the most. I'm the most successful. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. But I tell you, I tell you who hear me. This is interesting. Are are you hearing me, Jesus said? Are you really hearing me? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Love, do good, bless, pray. Those are the values that Jesus brought to the table. Now, American Christians in general, we struggle with this. Our brothers and sisters in Africa, 
our brothers and sisters in Asia, our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world in different cultures do not struggle with this the way we struggle with this, not just in the modern Western world, but particularly in America. We have a propensity to confuse the values of the kingdom of this world with the values of the kingdom of heaven. At best, this makes us completely ineffective in God's kingdom, and at worst, it will undo us. Now, the most striking example of what happens when Christians mix up these two values between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world was on full display on January 6th when rioters broke into the United States Capitol building. Now, that was a weird day, and in the crowd, if you look, there were all kinds of symbols present representing all kinds of people and all kinds of kingdoms. Um, Here's a few examples. Someone erected a noose and gallows outside the U.S. Capitol, and they were chanting things like, hang Mike Pence and where's Mike Pence? Here's another symbol that was on display Camp Auschwitz. Now, when we see images like this from that day, and we say, which team were these guys on? Are these guys on Team Jesus, Team Peter, or Team Judas? That's pretty easy to call, right? In fact, they're they're beyond Team Judas. Judas at least pretended to be one of God's people. We say, these are not part of God's team uh, filled with hatred and evil in this world. So those were some of the symbols we saw that day. What's interesting, however, is that there were other symbols present that day that tried to advance the name of Jesus. For example, there was this guy carrying the cross around on that day. There were signs in the crowd like Jesus 2020. Or if you look here, are are you right with God? Ye must be born again. Jesus saves. Now, at first, this one just looks like a sea of people, but I want to draw your attention over to the left. As we look at all these flags in the crowd, there's some interesting ones here. You see this one right here over on the left? There's two of them. I'm sorry, on the right? That's the Christian flag. It represents Jesus. It represents the church. In other words, part of the crowd of that day, part of the people who are engaging in lawlessness and violence were bringing Jesus' name into their activities. Now, one of the most interesting examples from this day actually came from the Senate chamber. Uh, After the people broke into the Senate chamber, they decided to have a prayer invoking the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, I'm going to show you a clip from that day. And uh, the person leading the prayer, interestingly enough, is the man who became famously known as the QAnon shaman, the guy who was uh, running around that day, I guess he's just strolling around, um, with kind of the Norse pagan mythology uh, get up and the headdress and all of that. Um, I want you to pay attention as they get into the Senate chamber and they pray this prayer. uh, The guy begins by saying, we invoke Jesus Christ. Pay attention to the language that they used in this prayer after they broke in. Check it out. I appreciate two things in that. One, that everyone took off their hats to pray out of respect. And two, that one guy took off his pagan headdress to pray in order to be respectful to the name of Jesus. But did you notice the language they used? It was all the language of the kingdom of this world. Take back. Show them. 
It was, it was the language of force. It was the language of power. It was the language of the sword. Now, many of the people who were interviewed after the fact said the reason why they were there was to deal with people they thought were acting unjustly. People who were there thought that injustice was being done, so they went there to do something about it. But my question is, why would people, and again, this is a minority of the crowd that day, why would people do that in Jesus' name? Why would they do that while invoking the name of Jesus Christ in the middle of their lawless act? Why would they carry Christian symbolism through the crowd? That one's actually pretty easy. The same reason why Peter did. Peter thought that God had lost control, so he used worldly power to reestablish control. Why did Jesus give Peter such a harsh rebuke for using worldly power to try and advance God's kingdom? Because at best, it made Peter completely ineffective, and at worst, it would undo him. How many non-Christians watching these images on that day, seeing Christian symbolism in the crowd, hearing the QAnon shaman invoke Jesus' name, as, as they watch that, tell me something. What's, what are they going to think of the church after watching that? How is our witness of the love of Jesus going to sound to them after they watch that? You cannot, we cannot ever use the values of the kingdom of the world if we're going to make a difference in people's eternities. It does not work. The church only goes backwards, not forwards. And here's why we need to get this right. Here's why we need to, in our own lives and in our faith community, here's why we need to get this right. The values of our culture have never moved more quickly than they are right now. There's never been a culture in history where values evolved as quickly as they are in our lifetimes. We are genuinely living in a time when no other humans have lived, when what people thought was right and wrong 40 years ago has been so turned on its head so quickly. And the reality is that from its founding until the mid-20th century, most Americans generally viewed America as being a Christian nation. What that means is... The politicians, the artists, the songwriters, everyone basically viewed life through the lens of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And in fact, some in the church started already to conflate the values of the kingdom of heaven and earth. We started to view America as God's promised land. We started to view uh, the United States as, as the new Jewish nation, as God's chosen people. And we started to view the Revolutionary War as our exodus, and Abraham Lincoln as our Moses, and the Constitution as our canonical sacred text, and the pastor as our president. And so he started closing his speeches with, God bless you, and God bless America. But suddenly, the church has found itself in a position of minority for the first time in American history. Did you play musical chairs when you were a kid? I was terrible at it. I was the skinny kid, tiny butt, could never win the game. But you know how like when you're walking around the chairs and they start getting taken out one by one, they never get taken out equally. So there's always that gap and you're coming up on it and you know the music is about to stop and you're going to be at that dead zone and you're going to lose. That's kind of where the church is today. We're, we've been playing musical chairs for several decades in America and every time a chair gets taken away, we still find a seat in the church. The Christians have always found a chair, but now we're at a place where we know the music is about to stop and we can see we're coming up on that place where there's not going to be a chair for us and Christians are starting to get worried what's going to happen to us. Us, what's going to happen to our rights? That's where Peter was. That's exactly where Peter was. He was afraid God had lost control, so he used worldly power to reestablish control. Here's what we need to see. Operating from a life-giving minority position is where the church has lived throughout its history. America was an anomaly. 
The church has thrived as a life-giving minority. It has been at its best. The kingdom of God has had its most impact when the church was a minority, and they couldn't even try to use the values of this world in order to advance the kingdom of God. They had to lean into love. They had to lean into prayer. They had to lean into kindness. They had to lean into goodness, and they had to trust that God was in control because there were no avenues by using worldly power to advance the church or advance the kingdom of God, and that's when the most lives and eternities have been changed. This shouldn't scare us a bit. This shouldn't worry us a bit. This is our calling. And God has given us stewardship of his church at this time. God determined the times and places in which we would live. And he said, you are going to live right here in 21st century America. And while you're here, I want you to advance the kingdom of God. And then we're going to hand it off to the next generation. And Hope Church, we are going to leave it in better shape than it was handed to us. And we are going to do that by loving and praying and blessing and serving and talking about the name of Jesus Christ. So what do we do with that in our lives? Because I'm pretty sure most of us weren't at the Capitol on January 6th, so that doesn't really apply to us. If you were, there are some very nice people who would like to speak with you. But how does this hit our lives? Because we're not a church that just casts stones at other people. What does this mean for me to live in God's kingdom and are my values aligned with God's values? Start with your marriage. What do you do when you feel like you're losing control in your marriage? Do you use the values of the kingdom of this world? Or do you say, I'm going to submit to my spouse? Because God said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I, even when I'm not getting my way, even when I'm losing control, I still think this is a submission competition. And husbands say, I'm still going to love my wife like Christ loved the church. And wife say, I'm still going to respect my husband and honor him like the church submits to Christ. That's what I'm going to do. Because the values of the kingdom of this world are not going to lead you back to a healthy marriage. But the values of heaven will. What about your workplace? Some of you work for the most toxic boss, and it is stressing you out. Some of you feel the pressure more, 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 sell, sell, sell. What are you going to do with that? Or for you, what's the purpose of work? Is it to get ahead, earn more, earn more, earn more? Or is it to love your neighbor as yourself and serve someone else and bless someone else? In the end, only one of those is going to be satisfying. In the end, only one of those is going to be life-giving and meaningful. Which is it going to be? I already opened this can of worm. What about politics? Do you keep Jesus before your political party or see an afterthought that you try to conform to your political party? Do you view people who vote differently than you as souls that Jesus loves or as enemies? Because only one view, the view from the kingdom of heaven, is actually going to change anyone's heart and change anyone's mind. I mean, we've spent the last decade in America trying to use the values of the kingdom of this world to change political minds, and that's not working too well. Or what about your wealth? What's the purpose of your wealth? Is it to give you a sense of identity, or is it to bless people and serve and do good? Some of you say, Jason, what are we supposed to do with all the injustice that we see? What are we supposed to do with all the wrong in the world? Are we just supposed to take it? Are we supposed to be fine with that? No. You should absolutely fight injustice. You should absolutely fight wrong. In fact, Paul tells you to. Look at what he said in 2 Corinthians. He said, for though we live in the world, this is the world we live in. We are part of the kingdom of this world. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Absolutely, you should fight, but not with the world's weapons and not with the world's values. What weapons do we have? That's what we saw in Luke chapter 6. Love, do good, bless, and pray. When you see something wrong, love, do good, bless, and pray. 
If you want to make the world a better place, love, do good, bless, and pray. As we do that, more and more, your heart will be aligned with the heart of Jesus, and your values will be aligned with the heart of Jesus. Because Jesus, who confronted evil through his death on the cross, and Jesus, who established a people and invited you into the family, just as you were, sins and all, failures and all, shame and all, invited you in and said, I have redeemed you and I have called you by name. Now Jesus invites you to live under his reign in his kingdom with his values to lead a life that makes an eternal difference. But the choice is yours. Will you live under the reign of King Jesus? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need your help. I need your help. We need your help because everything in our world pushes us towards the values of this world, toward gaining power through wealth, through force, through politics, through status, through titles, through whatever it is. And None of that matters for eternity. None of it. Spirit, would you help us to see that the wealth we have in this world, it's not our true wealth. That's in heaven. And it's safe for us there. Would you help us to see that the power and titles we have in this world, that's not our true power and titles because you've told us we will reign with you forever and ever when the kingdom of heaven and earth are unified when you come back, Jesus. Give us humble hearts. Give us clarity to see your values so that we can fully live under your reign in your kingdom. Give us that wisdom. Give us that courage. Give us that divine strength to trust you. We pray this in your name, Jesus.